Sorry. You got to figure that one out? No. I'll never get it all figured out. At least I hope I don't make it. All right, so next speaker here, Joey Branch. All right, guys. <clears throat> it's a uh, privilege to be here and speak with you a little bit about corn and what we what we experienced in 2019. So initially, I had a topic of going through and and just kind of going over what happened in 2019. Put that presentation together, and you know what? It just was flat out depressing. So <laughs> I got to this, and you know, I said, "Hey, what can I do to maybe get us going in the right direction?" And so. A checklist is kind of what I put there in, in, in together to try and help us be successful during our planning season that we're experiencing right now. This is the time that we, we try to get together and, and get our team together and, uh, and get a plan in place to, to make the corn crop that we, we hope to make. Um, as Jason said, my name is Joey Branch. I'm a certified crop advisor. I work for ProAg Services out of Newport, Arkansas. Um, you can see we, we typically stay within that Jackson Woodruff Prairie County circle. <coughs> area, but we've uh, we actually have a little you know we go into Independence County some we go into Poinsett and Craighead as well a little bit but <clears throat> that's that's our big footprint and ProAg employees eight eight people we've got um, five full time consultants and then three interns typically is what we'll what we'll have with us running throughout the summer. Um, I've been with ProAg myself for for eleven years. I got started crop scouting. I was a cotton scout at the age of 13. I had a had a um, a cousin who ran a cotton consulting business there in Poinsett and Craighead, Mississippi County, and he's the one that got me started. He told me, "Hey, just as soon as you get your your drivers, your learners permit, you can come to work." And he put me to work for a couple of days a week, you know, up until I was probably 14 or 15. And then then I learned really what uh, crop scouting was about. So. Um, Worked with him all through high school and college, pretty much. Been with ProAg for 11 years. Worked be 12 years in April. You can see the crops we typically scout. You know, that's our normal mix. We do dabble in a few other uh, crops. We've got some some purple hole peas that we're going to have this year. We're going to, you know, we'll occasionally have some peanuts and some Milo. Milo's really falling by the wayside with um, with the sugarcane apron. And you can take a look here at the map. You can see the star there. That's Memphis. That's where we're at. And we're just right across the river. Working that there's Newport. We work in that Tuckerman all the way down to, you know, Hazen, the Balls Bluff area as well. So, checklist, guys. It, it's all about planning. You know, we can't go into a a, a, a crop without a plan. It, it's that's it's so important, so important. I was looking for some some really um, some quotes to bring forth and. And the one that really stood out to me was by Abraham Lincoln, and, and and maybe it's because I can pronounce his name and not the guy up top there. But you know, when he says, "Give me six hours to chop down a tree, and I will spend the first four sharpening my axe," you know, that tells us just how important making a plan really is. And we've got to make sure that when we go into our corn crop, we know, hey, when we get to this point, we're doing this, we're doing that, and then we're we're ready to roll and get things going the way they need to be. And so, you know, just putting together a quick checklist. You, uh, you can see the things that I, I feel that are, that are important. That previous year, um, guys, that starts when we're on the combine in, in 2019. When we're out there combining the fields that we, we know our rotation. When we're in that corn and, and soybean rotation, that's typically how our, our crops will, will land in, in our area. We know that when we're, we're combining that, that soybean crop, all right, What's going on? Where are my good spots? Where are my bad spots? Can I go isolate and try and figure out what's going on? So that's a checklist that I like to really use. And, and so we'll, we'll kind of just go through that and also hit on some things from 2009 or 2019. Um, so uh, the planning date issue that Jason mentioned, guys, that, that was one of the things that really stood out to me. And I think if, if you take anything home today, it's the planning date issue. You know. Let's not get caught up on the calendar. Um, it's, it's so important that we get things going and we get things going correctly because if we don't <coughs> get it up even and uniform, I mean, we're just setting ourselves up for that lower yield potential already. I mean, we, we know that, hey, if we get that 32.5 up that Jason showed us, we're going to have 
the potential to be a little bit more successful with our corn crop. So planting date, let's not get caught up on that. Let's make sure that our conditions are where we want them to be. And we'll kind of discuss that a little bit as well. And then that hybrid selection. Uh, we learned this year that there's some hybrids that really uh, handle that early planted window a little bit better than, than others. You know, there, was, there were a couple that really stood out. And then our nutrient management challenges, guys, that was, that was, a, that was a pretty big issue this year. We, we, uh, we replanted some stuff. I guess you could call it replanting. We went in and spot planted some holes here and there. And, I mean, it was significant acres in the field, but man, trying to manage that, that, that became a headache. That became a headache and not, didn't work out very well. Not something I would recommend again if we got in the same situation. So, you know, talking about being on that combine and, and 2020 started in 19, you know, we're getting ready. You got to know that field's history. You got to know, all right, what, uh, what are my nutrient levels? So it starts out with soil samples. We got to get our soil sampling done in a timely fashion. That way we can be prepared and ready to fertilize for that yield goal that we're, that we're trying to obtain. Can't put out, uh, you know, fertilize for 180 bushel corn and expect to pull off 220. I mean, that, that checkbook's eventually going to run dry when you work it like that. Uh, what herbicides did we put out? You know, there, we've had issues in the past, and not so much anymore, but you can take a look at that picture there in the top right corner. Anybody know what that is? I have no idea, Joe. Keith Driggs <laughs> ought to know. I couldn't, I couldn't begin to tell you what that is. You know, that, that's the mess from carryover from, from uh, soybeans to corn. That, that's something that can run, <coughs> run be an issue for you. You know, we're not really using that much vermesphin anymore because we, we aren't killing the pigweed any longer <laughs> with it. I mean, it, it does some good things for us in soybeans. It, it's not a bad tank mix partner, but we got to be aware of when we're applying that because there's some cutoff restrictions, the, the amount that we're putting out. And this isn't the only one. This is just the most convenient one to throw up there and for you guys to take a look at. There are multiple others that you got to pay attention to. Um, do you got nematodes in your field? Did your soybeans suffer from wire? I had a soybean field. I, I called and talked to Gus about it. I don't know if Gus remembers this conversation, but I called and talked to Gus about a soybean field that I had to replant some spots because wire worms were absolutely wearing it out. So, I mean, you got to know these kind of things when you're going into that next, uh, you know, that next crop year. And so this is, a, this is an important part of your, of your checklist is going through that next, you know, that previous year, getting prepared, knowing the issues you got in your field and, and going from there. Uh, the next check, uh, checklist um, bullet points, the planning, planning season. You know, for 2019, I think y'all see from Jason's presentation, we had a pretty rough, pretty rough planning season. I mean, 2019 is one that, like I said, that presentation that I put together earlier, man, I wasn't too happy with it. It, was, it, wasn't, it wasn't something that I wanted to rehash a whole lot about. But um, rain, cold weather, we experienced it all. We had, we had some floods at times. We had some... Uh, stands that really took a hit. Um, that that uh, that cold, wet weather caused some some issues. And I think you can see. I hope you can see these pictures here. If you're not aware of what chilling injury, I heard Jason mention it earlier. But if you're not aware of what chilling injury is, here you go. There's some classic examples right there. That corkscrewing effect that you get going on. And honestly, guys, if you get some chilling injury that's happened in your crop, that's what you want. Because if we get that plant up, it becomes a weed. It's out there competing for nutrients, and it's out there competing for water, and it's not going to produce. It's not going to produce at all. So this is what we shoot for when we're trying to plant. We, we base a lot of our planting decisions off of those GDUs. You saw char the chart that Jason put together, and I'm glad he did that, because I think that just kind of reaffirms what we, as a, uh, as a firm there at ProAg, have been preaching to our growers. We like to start off with, um, we, we know we're going to plant, say, April 1st. So we want to look at that week after that, that plant date. And we're looking for three to five days after them. And we know that, hey, if we can get in that 40, 30 to 40 GDUs after planting, that we should have the potential to get a good, you know, a good even stand. So that's what we shoot for, and that's what we trigger our planting decisions based off of. 2019, um, I don't know if you can tell, but we didn't have a very good corn crop in 2019. We finished planting in the middle of May. That's not good. I mean, when we're having to plant that late to get our corn in, we, we're just not we're not setting ourselves up for for a uh, very prosperous year, anyways. So, on the planting subject, 
and on the depth. Guys, this is something that we, me and myself, myself and Brent Lasseter, uh, back in the back of the room, we we, we chase planters constantly throughout the, se the planting season and making sure that we get our depth where we need it to be. We've got one grower in particular, good night. He, if he thinks that there's a rain coming, we can't get it through his head. And I think we're about to get there. Well, we're about to get there, but if he sees a heavy rain coming, he's going he's gonna to shallow that planter up and put it an inch deep. And guys, it's just, how many of you field dry your corn? I mean, any of you guys let your field, corn dry in the field? So, which plant do you want out there holding up that ear? Do you want this one, this one, or this one? And guys, this is all due to planting depth right here. I want that one. So we gotta make sure that we're getting in that two, two and a half inch range. And that's gonna give us a, uh, it's gonna give us the, the best chance for uh, success for sure. Uh, just a couple pictures of some issues we run into. This one here happened, we had, <clears throat> we'd worked the soil just right prior to, actually the field cultivator was running through the field and the planter was falling right behind. This was planted underneath the pivot, flat planted. Planted it, we two inches deep, no doubt about it. I mean, no problem with the planting depth. What happened is we got us a really heavy rain right after we got planted, and you can see what happened. I mean, we we got uh, a good seed rise, is what I like to call it, and it's not it's not anything happened, but that heavy rain washed the soil away. And so you can see what happens when that when that occurs. Just inconsistent plants, uh, the the rooting. I mean much rather see that root, even though that plant there itself is not all that great and all that, not all that healthy, but you want that root system over that one any day. So, I mean, that's something that you always got to take into consideration. The, uh, the next checklist that I, the next bullet point on the checklist, fertility. Guys, this is kind of the program that we like to run, <coughs> you know, at planting, uh, in season, and I won't talk a whole lot about that, but just kind of let you see what we like to do. Biggest thing that I think y'all need to make sure you under, you're doing is getting some type of soil sampling going on. And I really like to grid sample. Don't have to do the variable rate fertilize, but guys at least get the grid sampling done. Do some type of precision sampling. It just gives you so much more information to make that, and this is an important decision. I mean, we're trying to fuel a crop for the whole year. We need to know exactly where my potash levels are. Need to know where my boron levels are. Hey, what about copper? Are you checking for copper? I mean, those are things that you've got to make sure that you're getting done. I mean, if we're doing A, B, and C right, which is our N, P, and K, how are we going to get over to that next yield bump? How are we going to get to that next goal that we want to meet? I mean, guys, it starts with boron. Boron's going to be the next one after that. That's the one you really got to make sure that you're getting getting going in that corn crop. Zinc's a very important one as well. Uh, but hey, once you get all those players in place, <coughs> copper is really starting to show out in some of our soil samples here lately. And another one, let me just bring this up. I don't, we use a lot of this, you know, probiotics, the plant growth regulators, and there's just too many to, to mention really. These are just some that we have had some, some uh, that I have some knowledge of that we've used. The reason we do that <coughs> It's because when we run into this situation like 2019, cold, wet, what happens? Phosphorus doesn't move into the plant very well. So we like to use these, these products to really help with that early season phosphate uptake. Uh, when are we setting the rows around, Jason? Is it v, V3 to V5 in that time frame? So hey, if we're setting the rows around already at that growth stage, and that corn crop's suffering from phosphate, you know, and not getting not getting the proper amount into the plant. What's our rows around going to look like? I mean, hey, you ever get out there and, and you see those you break those those uh, uh, cobs open and you count those 22s and those 24s? Those are magnificent. But what happens when you see a bunch of 14s and 12s out there? That doesn't lead to a very unless we got a 50 something thousand plant population, that's probably not gonna lead to that yield goal that we're after. And then we'll do a lot of spoon feeding in season. Um, we, we, with our soils, we've got, we've got the spoon feed. We just don't have the nutrient holding capabilities with our soils to, to uh, put a big slug out. So we do a lot of spoon feeding in season. And you'll see here, this is why we do the spoon feeding for the most part. Um, right there, that's about, 
B6. If y'all can read that, you can read better than me, but that's about B6 right there. And so what do we got going on? Look, nitrogen's really not calling for a whole lot. Potassium, not a whole lot there. Phosphorus, you know, these are our major players. When do we see that that thing really starts upticking? You know, right there about B10, <coughs> B8, that time frame. So that's, that's why we spoon feed. Now we're, we're putting nitrogen and we're putting phosphorus and potash and all that out <coughs> early, but we're also using it in season as well, trying to achieve those higher yield goals. Uh, tissue sample. Guys, this is another important tool I think that you need to be using. If you're not utilizing it, I think it's something you need to take a look at. This just helps reaffirm that what I put out there in the soil is getting into my plant. And so this is a very important tool in my opinion. And you can see here we had some, some uh, phosphorus issues early. And that was all due to you know, the wet, cold you know, <coughs> the season we had. Weed control. Guys, it doesn't matter if you're, if you're a conventional corn. And we, we've got a lot of conventional corn in our area. Or if you're a Roundup Ready corn. Corn is, is a big portion of our weed control. We, we have so many more options available to us to control the pig weed in our area. Is it, we need corn in our rotation. And so I really like to use some of these products that you'll see here just, just to take the pressure off of what we're using in soybeans. You know, uh, you know, some of these corn varieties have the ability to put Liberty over the top of them, but we don't do that. I mean, I like taking the pressure off. It helps in that rotation being able to kill some of those weeds with something different, just, man, that's, that's big for us. That's big. Um, and then, hey, what about after harvest? Anybody doing something for the pig weed control after harvest? Yeah, we're running Vermoxone. That's awesome, man. That's very, very good. And, that, and that's an important thing that I think we're missing. Because we get out there and we pick that corn in, in September, and stuff's sitting out there for, you know, three months of, adequate temperature to get a pigweed going then you got seeds that you're dealing with and all that work that we've done in season to try and head those uh, pigweed off it's kind of you know we're, we're, we're hitting ourselves in the in the head so that's that's very good I'm glad to see that y'all are doing that disease issues for 2019 we were I would say we had kind of a, a spotty year for disease the uh, southern rust is, is our big, that's our big target when we talk, talk uh, diseases in corn. It came in, uh, shoot, it seems like early, what I put up there? We had some come in uh, in June this year. I believe we typically find it in July. Um, <coughs> but not much of an issue in 2019. I tell you though, something that, that's really caught my attention in the past few years is this gray leaf spot. Any y'all dealing with that in your fields? Y'all seeing much of that going on? That's something that, that's really starting to fly under the radar. I think we wait and we wait and we wait so long on southern rust that we let this one go. And I, I really am starting to see some, some issues with gray leaf spot out in the field. So I think, I think that fungicide needs to be triggered maybe a little quicker than what we typically would do if we're, if we're just sitting here waiting for southern rust to show up. So disease management. Um, Guys, we, we're going to make, we're trying to get a fungicide budgeted in with our growers. I mean, we want that fungicide to go out as a preventive application. I mean, it's just so much easier to control southern rust, so much easier to control gray leaf spot, northern corn leaf blight, whatever disease you're talking about. So much easier to control it if you can get ahead of it. Whenever you get those diseases on hand, it's, it's hard to shut them down. And the biggest issue that I see is that we've got airplanes flying these fields and they're putting out three to five gallons of water, you know. We're not getting the canopy penetration that we need. So if we can go a little earlier, a little quicker, we're getting, getting that product out there a little earlier, I think we get a little bit better uh, canopy um, penetration doing it like, like that. So insect management, nematodes, that's a big deal for us now. Root knot nematodes. And stubby root nematodes, those, those two are causing some problems for us. Um, and there's really not just a ton of options out there. We, uh, we've got three growers now that we work with, I believe, that um, have started, that have equipped their planters with, with counter, or with the smart box system. And that is a real deal. When it comes to stubby root and when it comes to root knot, we've, we've done a really good job getting our corn back to 
uniform yield levels again. You know, us stubby root nematodes, whenever you're combining that field and you just see that, that crop of corn really dip and it comes back up and dip again, a lot of times what we found is that stubby root nematode causing that problem. And so whenever we get this counter out there and we're taking control, we're, we're controlling that stubby root nematode, it's uh, making that corn way more uniform. I think one of our growers this year told us that it was the best corn crop he's ever made on that field by putting the counter out there. And it, it was all due to the counter. Um, corn earworm, guys, we're definitely seeing slippage in that double and triple pro. Diptera seems to still be holding up pretty good. Uh, from a conventional standpoint on, on corn earworm control, <coughs> if, you're going, if you're thinking about doing something like a besiege or a prevathon, you've got to really get that timing. It's, you gotta be perfect. You gotta be perfect. It's difficult to do, but it can be done. Can be done. So let's talk about irrigation. The last check, check uh, the last bullet point on the checklist. Irrigation, guys, if you haven't looked at a soil moisture sensor, I think it's something you really need to be doing. We use a product called Syntec, and the reason we do it is because we, we cover a large area. Y'all saw our footprint. It's difficult for us to be two counties away and go and check that, that, uh, that moisture sensor to see if, uh, if we need to water or not. This one gives us the, the ability to uh, check and get on the interface. We get, it's, it's set up with telemetry, and we're able to just log in on that interface and check our, our uh, graphs and see, see what's going on. This is it. Uh, sucker's 36 inches long, is that right, Brent? 36 inches long. It's got a, a, a sensor every two inches, so it's measuring every two inches down to 36 inches. It does a really good job. Gives you a lot of great information. And one thing here that, that you can tell is you see we're getting really good water. Two inches, there's the blue's two inches, the red is four, six. That's right, six. And then down to 10, what do you see going on here? Not a whole lot. So we, we're gaining information even on compaction layers. Where's our, where are our roots getting to? I mean, this is some pretty good information that we get just by using the soil, sen uh, the moisture sensor. Recharge chart, guys, this is something that we are able to set early and adjust as the, as the crop progresses on, on uh, growth stages. So we get through the checklist and we're looking at our changes. What do, what do we need to do to try and make ourselves a little bit more successful, to give, give us a leg up on being a little bit more successful? Uh, planning changes. We've got strip tillage starting to come in, um, and I think that that's going to be a big benefit for us. Uh, we're leaving residue in between the, uh, the strips, and that gives that soil more opportunity to stay there after planting in these, you know you're going to get that four to six inch rain after you plant, it never fails, right? Never fails, so that gives us a, a good opportunity to keep that seed where it needs to be. Cover crops, guys, if we use cover crops, if we're recommending a cover crop in corn, we're going to terminate that pretty early. The reason we use cover crop is basically just to try and help hold those beds together. Um, soil moisture sensors, we're wanting to continue to use those and, and try and make a little bit more informed decisions. Fertility changes. Guys, this is something that's going to be new for me in, in 2020, is we're going to start applying potash throughout the season. It's going to be something that we spoon feed. I mean, we've got some guys that are high management, high yield goal guys that we're really trying to push and obtain some, some good yields with. So that's going to be in their plan. Boron, guys, pay attention to boron, something we really got to get get um, get a little bit more con conscientious about. So on the disease and insect side, the one thing that stands out to me is we've got more guys that need to be running counter. Just we've got a lot of issues out there on the nematode side, so we've got to be running a little bit more counter. Um, and then we'll run some trials. Guys, uh, we, we as a company really like to get out there and, and look at new things. We, you know, uh, and then also try, try new things. These thoughts and ideas that we have at the, at the end of the day, we, we like to try and implement them through some of these trials. So anybody got any questions about anything? Yes, sir. Uh, do you have any guys running in for your planning? Yes, sir. Yeah, we sure do. Sure do. You got an opinion on that? Is that a you know, I think it's I think it's very good. I mean, especially I think I mentioned it earlier about the the phosphorus, the early season phosphorus, the 10340. You know, we like to run something like that, and I think it's important for especially when we get these wet, cold seasons. Um, you may not all the time see increased yield at the end of the day, but what you 
or ensuring is that roll around, that early season phosphorus uptake just really helps increase with that. We had some early starter fertilizer trials this year, some zero yield response. We had one that just the starter alone, three or four gallons, gave us 20 bushels. What about, the, I mean, dry is easier, but as far as knocking it in versus urea, I saw you had urea on there. Yes, sir. It's a convenience issue for us. You know, we, we've got guys who, who farm, you know, up to a couple thousand acres of corn, don't have the ability to get across it, knocking it in. So that's the biggest driving factor with the urea. Any other questions? All right, guys. Thank you all. I really appreciate it. Oh.